The um, trip operon will be the opposite, right? The trip operon, if tryptophan is present, if tryptophan is present, tryptophan will act as a co-repressor binding the regulatory protein. The regulatory protein will bind the operator. So in the presence of tryptophan, the repressor protein is bound to the operator and polymerase cannot pass through. In the absence of tryptophan, the repressor protein is released. Polymerase can transcribe. Does anyone need that repeated? Okay. If the LAC repressor gene is mutated, so the allosteric site of the protein no longer binds allolactose, what would be the effect on transcription of the LAC operon? Look at that's not the right trip. Um, what do you guys think? If the LAC repressor gene is mutated, the allosteric site cannot bind allolactose. What would be the effect on transcription? Is it go all the time or don't go at all? Put it in the chat. On or off? Since we need allolactose as our inducer to bind the repressor, to release the repressor, if allolactose cannot bind the repressor, the repressor will stay in place. The operon will be off. It will not transcribe. Good. And TRIP, T-R-Y-P, tryptophan, what do you think about that? Would it be left on or would it be left off if tryptophan could not bind its repressor? Since tryptophan acts as a co-repressor, binding the repressor allows it to, to stop the operator. If tryptophan cannot bind, the repressor cannot bind, and therefore the operon will stay on. Good. Good, good. Okay, so you guys get that idea pretty well. Um, let's go to our new topic of the day, which is viral gene control. There is a few videos embedded along the way. So we'll do this and then we have a gizmo to help us understand uh, the lytic cycle a little bit better. So it, there are so many different viruses you could talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about bacterial phages. Remember bacterial phages from Hershey and Chase's experiment? They are viruses that affect bacteria, literally bacteria eater, bacterial phage, right? A lot of kids want bacteriophages to be bacteria because the name bacteria is in it, but they're viruses. Okay, so phage are typically our, our virus there. So characteristics of a virus, um, they are acellular. So they're not a cell. They are molecular molecules. <laughs> molecular molecules, is that redundant? They're molecular structures. Um, so they either have single or double-stranded DNA single-stranded DNA, or they could have single or double-stranded RNA. So they have one or the other, typically, and they work by taking over the host protein synthesis process. So they cannot reproduce themselves. They can't make pro more proteins on their own. They have to use the host machinery if you will, um, to make their protein. And there's two different life cycles, the lytic and the lysogenic. Typically, they all have these steps in together. There's attachment. So the virus has to attach to some receptor protein on the surface of the cell. Penetration, it's injecting its genetic material into the cell. Biosynthesis, it's making it's the cell, not the virus. The cell is making the proteins that are needed to make more viruses. Maturation, those pieces are put together and then released. And so those viruses um, are released from the cell and then move out to um, affect other cells. So this is the typical process 
Um, some bacteriophages, animal viruses, and retroviruses do not necessarily follow this path. So lytic and lysogenic are kind of interconnected. So lytic will immediately destroy the DNA of the host cell, makes more cells, makes more viruses, and the cell will burst, releasing the, um, the new viruses. The lysogenic cycle is kind of like, almost like the G0 phase. It's taking a break from the cycle. So it starts the same. It incorporates the DNA, its genetic material into the host DNA. Rather than destroying the DNA, it remains dormant or latent and it will be replicated as that cell is replicated. When conditions are right, it exits that lysogenic cycle and enters the lytic cycle where it will destroy the DNA, make more viruses and release the viruses. So this would be um, like um, cold sores. If you have cold sores, you know, they come and they go, right? So they, the virus is always there, but it lays dormant. So that would be an example of lysogenic. Okay, I guess this is kind of a repeated slide now that I look at it. So this is just showing you um, the attachment and the penetration both at once. Um, this shows you the destruction of the bacterial DNA since we're doing bacterial phages. So then that bacterial um, DNA, we're gonna use pieces of that to create proteins related to the virus and the virus will be put together, assembled, and then it destroys the cell. So here is a little video because I like animations because I think they help you understand it better. So here we go. Where's the sound? Bacteriophage T2 begins with a bacteriophage particle binding to the surface of the bacterial cell. The phage particle injects its genetic material or DNA carried in the capsid of the... Hang on, I'm trying to turn it up. Could you guys hear it okay? The life cycle of bacteriophage T2 begins with a bacteriophage particle binding to the surface of the bacterial cell. The phage particle injects its genetic material or DNA carried in the capsid of the bacteriophage into the host cell. Once inside the cytoplasm, genes in the phage DNA direct the degradation of the host cell DNA and are able to utilize proteins within the host cell for the synthesis of new T2 phages. First, many copies of the phage DNA are made. The phage DNA encodes the proteins which form the capsid and the regulatory proteins which direct their production and assembly into phage coats. The newly made capsid proteins and phage DNA molecules assemble into a new generation of phage particles, and the cell is lysed, releasing the mature phage particles. I especially liked the, um, the assimilation or the synthesis in that video. Um, so the lysogenic, this is the one I talked about that has like a pause where it integrates its own DNA in with the bacteria's DNA rather than destroying the DNA right away, okay? So there's integration of the viral DNA and then the viral DNA is now called a prophage, okay? So it will be replicated each time the cell replicates because it's part of that cell's DNA. When the, you know, when you go through mitosis, you make, um, well, when you go through synthesis of interphase, you make copies of it. And then the cell splits during mitosis. And so you get extra copies of it. So this is a way of duplicating and the number of cells that are infected with the virus without the virus having to be synthesized. If that makes sense. Um, so, now you have these lysogenic cells because they contain the provirion, right? When environmental factors are correct, like with your cold sores, I believe stress is one of those factors. Um, the environmental factors may induce the prophage to re-enter the lytic phase. So now it's being, it's going to re-enter the lytic phase where it'll then go through the synthesis 
an assembly of the viruses and lice the cell. Okay, um, so how are they affecting the genome? So viral DNA contains a promoter sequence like our DNA, like bacteria's DNA. Promoter sequences, remember, is where uh, RNA polymerase binds. But what it's binding to is the host RNA polymerase. So it has its own promoter that matches the RNA polymerase. Um, and then the host RNA polymerase will transcribe the um, viral DNA. And that degrades um, the RNA shutting down the host gene expression. So instead of making the host proteins, it'll make the virus proteins. So that's incorporating it into the bacterial DNA. A good example, HIV, which is actually a retrovirus, um, infects cells with surface CD4s. So you have certain proteins, right? Marker proteins on the surface of your cell. So, so does your virus. So they have to match. So like 1% of the population is actually immune to HIV because they have a mutated CD4 receptor. And so the HIV cannot bind and therefore cannot penetrate. So um, in this case, we have um, the genetic code enclosed by a phospholipid membrane that is from the previous host cell. So it's like taking part of the membrane. This is why it goes undetected because it's actually coated with your own host, like your own cells. And then it fuses with the membrane like phagocytosis, right? It fuses with the membrane of the next host cell. And that's what you see here. Um, so it becomes part of that membrane, opening up, releasing its genetic code. So, um, HIV is a retrovirus, so it starts with that RNA, and then it has to reverse transcribe. That's what it means by retro, and it's going to create DNA. So it's creating what's called cDNA. That was one of those vocabulary words on our last chapter review, but we didn't use it, right? So um, it'll create that cDNA, and then it will go through and transcribe again. So it keeps going back and forth. Um, and remember, RNA polymerase doesn't have that editing, proofreading skill. And so that's why there's so many changes in RNA viruses or retroviruses. They're constantly changing their code because they make mistakes. So it's very hard to find a vaccine that fits that. Um, so this is the single strand RNA for HIV. Okay, it carries reverse transcriptase. So then, um, so the blue is the viral. And then reverse transcription is going to create the DNA from that RNA while degrading the RNA, okay? So RNA transcribes into single-stranded DNA and then RNA is broken down. And I already talked about the proofreading concept. Um, so then you use transcription and once again, moving forward, make your RNA and then you go through your translation. So you go RNA to DNA back to RNA. Lots of changes along the way. Um, so this would be your lysogenic cycle where that DNA gets incorporated into the host cell and or the host DNA, right? And then it remains dormant until something triggers it. And then it exits that lysogenic cycle and re-enters the lytic cycle, which is the one that destroys, okay? So here is once again, a closer look so this is HIV, it's a typical retrovirus, meaning that it has an outer envelope, and in the center, it has two copies of RNA, as well as an enzyme here in blue that's reverse transcriptase, which will ultimately turn that RNA into DNA. Um, the, the virus itself, with this outer envelope protein, uh, actually directly infects T helper cells. The way that it does this is that as it comes up to the cell surface, it uses receptors that are on T helper cells and exclusive to T helper cells, which are CD4 molecule, which really defines T helper cells. It's a surface receptor that binds to the envelope protein. It, that causes a conformational change and allows a second receptor to grab hold of the envelope. This is the chemokine co-receptor. It's also called CCR5, and we'll talk about that more. What happens now is that the, the, the stalk of the envelope protein uh, 
pierces through the, uh, from the virus into the, into the host cell and starts to draw the two cell membrane, the cell membrane and the viral membrane together. And what ultimately happens is fusion of those two membranes and the viral genetic material is injected essentially into the cell and the envelope protein is left at the cell surface. The virus has a matrix and a capsid protein shown here in green and red that, that essentially are digested when it enters into the cell. That releases the viral enzymes and the viral RNA. And here we have reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral RNA and using host nucleotides, converts that viral RNA into a single strand of DNA. While it does that, it makes some random errors, which is characteristic of reverse transcriptase. It has very poor proofreading activity. That single-stranded DNA now is again reverse transcribed into a double-stranded DNA. At that point, another enzyme that has come in with the virus in the beginning called integrase essentially grabs hold of that double-stranded DNA and carries it through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the cell. Within the nucleus of the cell, it finds the host chromosome, and it basically, the integrase enzyme, makes a nick in the host DNA and allows for HIV to insert itself into the host chromosome. And that right there is what establishes lifelong infection. Now, RNA polymerase comes along and makes messenger RNA. Those messenger RNAs encode for different viral proteins. They end up associating with ribosomes on the, at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And here's a piece of mRNA that's making envelope protein, which is directly produced into the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's shuttled then through the endoplasmic reticulum and taken to the cell surface, where at the cell surface, it becomes embedded in the cellular membrane and at this point, coalescing with other envelope proteins that have been produced, you have this cluster of envelope proteins now on the surface of this infected cell. At the same time, there are other messenger RNAs that are being produced that allow for translation of other uh, viral proteins. So here are additional viral proteins being made, which are going to be used to make up the key components that, uh, that the virus ultimately is going to need. These are transported again to the cell surface to the area where these envelope proteins are, and a strand of RNA as well as a, some of the enzymes are part of that complex. This then buds off at the cell surface at this point, but it's still not a mature virion because the polyprotein chain needs to still be digested into its component parts. That's done by an enzyme called protease. Protease breaks up those uh, polyprotein chains and ultimately allows for them to coalesce and form the mature uh, structures that make up the final virion. And now you have a mature infectious virion that can go on now to infect other cells. Once that happens now, the cell can produce tons of viruses, and this is really what then keeps the whole process going. Okay. I know that was kind of a long video, but it's, it's just amazing how much they have figured out, I think, about that virus. So let's actually start this treatment video with just a quick refresh. And now that I think... Maybe I should have just started tomorrow with that because tomorrow you're going to work with an HMI site with the, the um, HIV concept. And today you're working with um, a gizmo site that has to do with the lipogenic cycle or the lytic cycle. So we've done these two things. So this is going to be a gizmo. And this is specific to the lytic cycle. So the one that is causing them to be destroyed. So um, you've done gizmos before, but this one is more of a simulation. So um, read the directions and it tells you what to do along the way. Um, I don't know that I actually put the link in. So the link is the title. So if you click the title and then remember you guys have signed in with a code. If you don't use your code, you will be kicked out in five minutes, okay? 
So if you forgot your code, um, let me know and I can get that for you. Um, but you're gonna launch this um, gizmo. So it's a little bit different than the last one, which was kind of more of a storyline. And um, the worksheet tells you what adjustments to make and basically you're observing what happens as you make those changes. Um, I'm reading in the chat here. No, tomorrow's quiz is just going to be the Operon. Like, we've been working with the Operon, so I figure by now we should know it. So it'd be good to take a stop and, and just quiz that piece. Um, Lytic Lysogenic is not tomorrow, okay? Tomorrow after the quiz, we'll work um, with the HIV, I believe. The quiz is on the Operon. We will be taking it on a Google form, just in Google form. It's not going to be in Illuminate and it's not in AP Classroom. Okay. At first, I thought you meant content, and then I realized you meant format. Okay. So I will let you guys work on the gizmo alone. These gizmos, the worksheets make them look like they're long, but it's really just spread out and expanded and it's, it, they don't take as long as it looks like it does. Okay, so stick around if you want help on the Operon, you need your code to get into this, or you have questions of any other kind.